Hi, thank you for coming. So I'm here to talk about Elasticsearch and DevOps. About me, my name is Dmitry Polyakovsky. I'm a software developer. I do some backend stuff, some DevOps stuff, some UI stuff. Why are you smiling? Actually, I should probably stand here and talk into the microphone. Okay, excuse me. If you're interested, you can follow me on Twitter. You can read my blog, where you'll find content similar to this presentation. And I'm also co-organizer of Seattle Redis Meetup. If you're interested, come talk to me. If you want these slides, just take a picture of this, and that bit.ly URL will get them for you. How many people have used Elastic? Again, another survey? OK, so what do you guys use it for? Logs? Logs. Green log on the back. Okay. Back up. OK, how about just search, right? Do you have like an application where you're indexing data? Anybody using Elastic as a primary data store? Go back one slide. Oh, sorry about that. Anybody using Elastic as a primary da data store? Wow, you're a brave man. What are you, st what are you storing in there? Uh, electrical load statistics. So like time series data? Yep. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, I use, it, I use it for like a secondary data store where my primary database is in you know, Postgres and I'm indexing certain documents for search or records in the primary database. And uh, then I also have a lot, a lot, a lot of logs going into my logs, going in there mostly via log stash. Okay, so Elasticsearch is often mentioned as part of Elk Stack, which is Elastic, Log, Stash, and Kibana. Elastic is based in Lucene. You've got indexes that contain many documents, and then documents will have key value pairs, which is best to have similar key value pairs, similar schema, so to speak, per index, but it's okay to have different one. It's just more space efficient and faster to have similar documents. What Elastic adds on top of Lucene is the ability to shard, doc, in shard indexes and replicate it. So you'll have a node, let's say, with you'll have a cluster with, let's say, three data nodes. And within that node, when you create an index, it'll be sharded five different ways. And those shards will be placed in different nodes, but it'll also be replicated. So you can lose one of the nodes and still retain all your data. And Elastic does it out of the box for you. You don't have to do anything. Here's a high-level diagram. So we have data that's coming in from different sources. It's indexed and it's made searchable, and then it lives in one or even several clusters, and you can run queries against it from your applications. Logstash started as a very simple tool. Take your logs and stash them in Elastic, make it easier to analyze them. But it grew into a very powerful ETL pipeline that has several hundred different plugins. The plugins in Logstash are just Ruby gems. If you're familiar with Ruby, it should be very easy to understand what they do if you actually want to look at the source code. And uh, you can have input, filter, and output plugins. So here's a, another picture. We can take in here data from either HTTP endpoint or a database or a file system or RabbitMQ or a Kafka. We're running it through this pipeline, filtering out some of the data, transforming it and sending it to any of these destinations or more. You can send data to Redis, to JDBC adapter, to SQS and AWS. So. Kibana is the dashboard. You can use it to build ad hoc queries. You can build dashboards and with, rich visualization, with rich visualizations. You can export data into spreadsheets or PDFs. Here's a screenshot of a dashboard. We're analyzing Apache log files and we can each one of these is a separate little visualization combined into a dashboard. There are a lot of different things we can talk about when it comes to Elastic. They have a product called Beats, which is a lightweight data shipper you can install directly on your servers and they'll send you things like metrics, CPU, or RAM. It's very useful for just monitoring. There's also another product they recently acquired for application performance monitoring. Think New Relic within your Kibana dashboard. This way you don't have to go to a separate screen and pay more money to New Relic. But I really had to narrow down this presentation, so I decided to focus on three things. How we can get data into Elastic, then how we can get it out, otherwise our disk will, will eventually fill up. And then I'll do a quick demo of what we can do with Kibana. So how can we get data into Elastic? I'm sorry, was that a question? No, sorry. Okay. Again, guys, feel free to ask questions. Just raise your hand. How many people have used ETL tools? What do you guys use? Pentaho, anybody? Microsoft SQL reporting services? Lots of custom bash files. 
Come on, who has not used a custom bash file as part of the ETL tool? <laughs> so at my work, I actually build a data processing pipeline using Elasticsearch, and what I'm doing is I'm processing lots and lots of AWS ELB logs. You can configure Elastic Load Balancer to snapshot its log, not the Nginx or Apache log, but actual load balancer log to S3. You can either do it every five minutes or every 60 minutes. And here's a sample line from that log file. And you can see there's a lot of useful data here. You can see the time, you can see the IP that this request came from. You can kind of see a URL here with some useful parameters like CAD and AID and the user agent. And as I said, this is based on the real system I built at work, but I decided to simplify it because at my day job, we, I'm processing logs with like 30 or 40 different parameters and there's lots of very complex business logic to what to do depending on different conditions. So we are gonna have a very simple log with CID and AID, customer ID and account ID. So here's a line of log file and it's easy to visually inspect it, but imagine processing you know, thousands and thousands of these logs with millions of lines in each. To do that, we're gonna use a log slash S3 input plugin. Very easy to configure. We literally just create a .conf file like this and we say input bracket bracket and we're saying S3, we can either put IAWS credentials in this file or put them in an external file. I prefer to keep my credentials always in separate files and then version control these log stash config files. We specify the S3 bucket and we can optionally specify the prefix essentially a subfolder because often people will have one S3 bucket and then multiple load balances will put their logs there. Any questions? Should we keep going? Take it as a yes. So pretty easy config file to create. The thing about Logstash, what it does is it keeps track of how far it processed log files. So what you can do is you can stop Logstash, do whatever maintenance on the server, upgrade the version of Logstash. And when you start it up, it's gonna know that it processed log files up to a certain point in time. So it'll continue processing them from that point on. So if you stop Logstash at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, start it up an hour later, it's gonna go back to 2 p.m., process that one hour of data. Obviously, there will be a slight delay, but that once it catches up, it's gonna keep processing data in near real time. So I'm running you know, gigabytes and gigabytes. Actually, I'm running overall through my log stash, probably close to 100 gigs a day. But through this one particular pipeline that's formed the basis of this presentation, I'm running multiple gigabytes per day, and it's maybe 30 seconds delayed. So it's very fast. But the way, this, uh, the way it keeps track of how far it processed files is it uses a file called senseDB, and it just lives inside a logstash folder and is a separate file for each pipeline. Because you, again, often you have multiple pipelines within, Elast within logstash. One may be processing files from this S3 bucket, another one may be querying this JDBC data source, or a different S3 bucket, and there's a separate since DB file for each pipeline, so it knows how far it's processed in each pipeline. Okay. Then the output, the pipeline can actually have multiple outputs, meaning we can send data to multiple destinations. But here we're just gonna send it to Elasticsearch. We're gonna specify the hosts, username and password, and index pattern. So we're gonna say it's gonna be events, dash, and then date stamped here. Pretty simple process, follows very similar follows very similarly to log file rotation that we do on a daily basis. We can also have this STD out output, and that is a useful thing to do when you're debugging these scripts. But here I just commented it out. Now that we've grabbed data from S3 and we figure out where we're gonna send it to in Elastic, we gotta do some filtering. Because if you remember that log file, there's just a lot of data that's not very useful for my business users. Like they don't care about what the load balancer name is. They don't care about what the private IP of the server behind load balancer is. So to filter stuff, we're gonna use first a filter, grok plugin. And Logstash provides lots of these grok expressions for you. So this one is ELB access log. It knows the exact format of the ELB log files. And at the end of my presentation, I'll give you guys a link to where all of these are documented on the GitHub repo. And there's just, I don't know, 30 or 40 at least. 
you could, there's one for Apache, one for Nginx, but I'm processing ALB logs. So this will just basically take the message and just parse it, take that one line and parse it and convert it into a bunch of key value pairs. So it'll know which field is ELB name, which field is backend IP. And then I'm gonna use this remove field action, which basically will get rid of the data I don't care about, like backend IP or backend port. Now that I've processed it through these two filters, I have something that looks like this. I can see request, response, client IP, path, params. But what my users care about is this parameter string because they care about the different customer ID and account ID. And I want to see reports, for example, how many customers or how many accounts access the system. Also, here's a client IP, which I can use to do a pro geo proximity mapping and show my users where the people are coming to the website from. But like I said, what we really care about is this param string. So to do that, we're gonna write a little bit of Ruby code. Anybody written Ruby or Python scripts? Okay. So we can create another filter within the same config file and specify Ruby and then specify code right there in the config file. And we say parameters equal event get parameters. So what we have here is we have this event object, which is essentially um, this. This is an event object inside Logstash. And we can call get method and set. So we're going to say we're going to get params, which is just that URL string, question mark, CID, ampersand, AID. And then we're going to do a plain old CGI parse. It's just a URL. And then we're going to loop through the parameters that we care about, CID, AID, and grab the value and set it as individual attribute on our event object. Does that make sense? Okay. So, and then we're gonna do close quotes. So everything between quotes is Ruby code. Now, our event object looks like this. We still got request, response, etc. but additionally we have CAD and AID, which is what we want. We want these attributes from the URL string to be logged as separate fields in Elasticsearch. Except, I didn't like putting my Ruby code inside my config file. Anybody can guess why? Well, it's a pain in the butt to test, first of all. Even simple things like syntax highlighting don't work very well, because I'm opening a .conf file, not a .rb file. So what, what this Ruby plugin introduced about six months ago, they introduced a new feature, is to load Ruby code from a separate external script. And a really nice thing about that is you can now write this one script and leverage in multiple conf files from multiple pipelines. So you get a little bit more consolidation of your business logic. And you do two things. You specify path, which is required. It's either path or code, by the way. You can't do both in the same section. Right? So you have this Ruby path to the script. And you can optionally pass the script params. So the script, oh, by, the, by the way, you also have to specify an absolute path to the script. So inside this Ruby script, you have to define a register method. Actually, that, that one is optional, but then if you pass params, you can set them here to be class variables. I'm sorry, instance variables. And then they can use, be used within any, anywhere within the script. And then what you must have is you must have a filter method. And filter method accepts event. And I'll give you a link at the end of my presentation to a wiki page or to a blog post on the Elastic website where they document it in much more depth. So here, in the filter method, we accept event. And again, we follow a very similar logic where we say, okay, event get params. The only difference is we have to return this event as part of an array. And if we, instead of doing event.cancel, if the parameter string was nil, by the way, because that, it could be a situation where you have a URL that just did, never had any params, and you may have a business rule that says, don't process this any farther, this is of no business value. So doing, in this screen, doing event.cancel if params nil basically stops the processing of this particular record. Not the entire file. The entire log will continue to be processed, but that one particular row will be thrown away and it will never show up in your Elastic data store. Here it's a little bit different. You have to basically return an empty array right here if there are no parameters. And you can have additional business rules for other validation, like maybe you only have CID but not AID and you have to have both. So you can, again, stop execution if not all of the required parameters are present in that one line. And then we do the same thing. We're parsing those parameters, we're looping through, and we're returning this event. 
it looks exactly the same as before. It's that hash. Yes, question? Uh, actually, not yet, but okay. I'm, I'm starting to get a little lost because I'm, okay. I'm still trying to learn how to use Elasticsearch okay. properly. But Ruby itself, I think, is where I'm starting to get a little okay. lost. So I was just going to hold off on questions. Okay. This. Well, Chris, you're going to get a little bit more lost because I'm going to go farther into Ruby. But you can come talk to me afterwards or you can email me if you have any questions. Okay. okay. So this basically allows us to extract this. Yes, go ahead. Just so I actually follow on that. For those of who aren't real with Ruby, yeah. Unfortunately not. No. You can do something hacky where you essentially wrap a, wrap a Python script inside a Ruby script, but unfortunately, lo, so lo, what log stash plugins that Ruby gems. So that's why it's very easy for them to support execution of Ruby code inside these. And by the way, it's just plain Ruby. It's a little bit harder to load a third party library into this. But I think even pulling logic out of a config file, first of all, you don't actually don't have to use this Ruby lo, solution. There are other uh, plugins you can use to filter the data. There's like a key value pair plugin. And for something as simple as what I have here with just CID and AID parameters, I could split that string using tools other than Ruby. In my case, I have 30 to 40 different parameters. I have lots of business logic. So in my case, having that flexibility of writing code inside my log stash, my ATL pipeline, actually proved to be very valuable. Okay. So, but here, basically, I have this Ruby script. It's not that different than Perl or Python script. So you just have to remember that because of the specifics of the Ruby filter plugin for the log stash pipeline, you have to have these two methods. You have to have register method. It's actually, that one's actually optional. And you have to have filter method. And this is where you put the logic. And this is just a regular .rb file. And uh, it j acts just like a regular Ruby script. You can even say, you know, my filter method has gotten a little big. I want to create a separate method below that. And you declare it, you call it, and you follow the same process. But now, instead of it having one very large method with 20 to 30 lines of business logic in there, you can have two methods or three that are much, much more manageable. Okay. And you can write tests for these Ruby scripts using the framework provided by Logstash. So below, again, it's all going to be in the same .rb file. Below all your business logic, you're going to put this block called test something do. And you're going to pass a parameter string like this. So you're saying params equals CID, AID. And then you're saying expect params do. And then you're saying events first CID equals 123 and AID equals 456. So this is actually, you can quite, write as many of these as you need and test your code using, using these automated tests and it becomes much, much safer to deploy it after you've tested it well. Okay. So now I'm gonna go a little bit farther into Ruby and I apologize if some of you might find it too much, but again, just feel free to ask questions. So Ruby scripts are nice. What's even better than scripts is Ruby classes. So what I'm doing as I'm going, the next step, what you saw before was the recommended solution by Elastic Company. This is kind of my own secret sauce I added on top of it. And it's actually proven to be extremely valuable in, my, in the application that I built. I take the logic from the Ruby script and move it into a Ruby class. And then I simply include it here via this require relative path to a Ruby file. So this makes my script much smaller. So just like I took logic from a config file, moved it to Ruby script, I'm now taking it one step further. But this is very simple Ruby object or, or yeah, Ruby object oriented programming. I create this class. I create some methods here. I mo literally copy and paste the code from that filter. Here I put it in a method called perform. I break it farther down into smaller methods. I can create additional classes. So I can go object oriented programming all the way if I want to, but I don't need to. I could I could just stop at a very simple script, a very simple Ruby class if I don't need to have more business logic. And I can even write unit tests with a tool like RSpec or Minitest, if you're familiar with the Ruby unit testing frameworks, <coughs> where I can create these fake event objects, pass them in, and test very granularly. For example, in that Ruby script that I showed you here, I have to test everything through this filter. 
even though I might create additional methods further down to encapsulate some of my validation logic. Let's say I have a method to validate what, the event and see if, whether if, if it's missing certain parameters, I shouldn't process it anymore. There are times when I'm doing unit testing, I want to test very granularly just that logic. And I can't really do it with the approach, with this approach where I'm testing it via the log stash way. But if I move the logic further down into Ruby classes, I can control that process with a much greater degree of flexibility and write much more precise tests for it. So you don't have to go this way, but if you're comfortable with Ruby and tools like RSpec or other unit testing frameworks in the Ruby world, you can't go. Okay. Object-oriented programming is a good thing. It's sometimes not easy, but it's a good thing. Are there questions? Yes? Performance hit for going all the way from using standard patterns, like in the example you have here. Yeah. Nothing I've noticed so far. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it just loads Ruby code either from the script or from external file and runs it. So, anything else? Yes? Did it play slow in Ruby? Uh, <laughs> lots and lots of websites. Uh, we can Google it after. But yeah, just loop, there's like Ruby on Rails website is pretty good, but it mo focuses more on Rails. But yeah, there are tons of. Tots Plus has, has some good articles. Ruby Tapas, that's another useful video blog. Okay, so now that we talked about these, this way we can get data into Elasticsearch. Eventually, if we just keep writing data into our, to a, into our database or Elastic Data Store, it's gonna fill up the disks. So there are two things we wanna do. First, of all, we wanna back up this data in case our server crashes. And second, we wanna implement archiving process. In this case, we're talking about time series data. So we have this nice thing about it is that we don't have to back up the entire Elasticsearch cluster or server. We can just back up yesterday's data. So I have several processes that run overnight, and they back up indexes that were created the day before. And I don't really worry about indexes from previous days because I know that they already backed them up the day before. So I don't need to back up, do a full backup on my Elasticsearch. So there are two things, there are, there are several ways we can do these backups, and again, this approach that I described to you essentially implements once a day backup, so it's not a solution for like point in time recovery. But one very simple way to implement this is using Amazon S3, everybody familiar with that, I presume? And you create in Elasticsearch what's called a repository, which corresponds to S3 bucket. You have to first install this plugin, now, this is Elasticsearch plugin, not Logstash plugin, but it's called repository s3. They also have one for just HDFS and for Google, I believe. And once you install this plugin, you can make requests to Elasticsearch API to create this repository. This is not like GitHub repository, this is just a data repository. So we're saying, hey, create snapshot, and we're going to call it Elastic S3 repo, and it's going to point at Elastic S3 repo bucket but the type is S3. That's what tells it that it needs, that's what tells, that's what tells Elasticsearch it needs to make a behind the scenes call to AWS S3 APIs and set up this relationship. Then it actually create like a few files there that it uses to store some information. So now that we created this bucket and then pointed, we point, next is we pointed repository at this bucket, we can run commands against Elasticsearch to create these snapshots. And again, a snapshot is a specific index or indexes that follow a certain pattern. And we can run these commands via curl, we can run them via the Kibana dashboard I'll show you later. But Elasticsearch company also provides a tool called Curator. It's a simple Python tool, and it uses this YAML config file to define specific actions. And you just run it via cron. So I just have a cron that runs overnight, and at one o'clock in the morning it runs action one, it, like 20 minutes later, it, ran, it runs a separate action for a different action file to do, to, to do other tasks and other indexes. I just, I like to give them enough time to complete the previous tasks before it starts working on the next one. So here's an example of a YAML file. This action is snapshot, which basically takes the index. So I say, here's the repository, Elastic S3 repo. And I say, the name of this 
snapshot is going to be events and then year, month, date, pattern. And you can either wait for that snapshot to complete or you can just say false. I, I usually don't wait for them to complete in this, but it's a cron process. If you're running it manually, you can actually watch it. But since it's running in the middle of the night, I just specify this wait for completion false. And then I specify a filter or filters, which, meaning which indexes do I want to include in this snapshot. So I'm specifying a pattern. Basically, everything begins with na name events because that's how I named all my indexes. Again, in Elasticsearch, there really isn't a concept of databases and tables, right? Everything is, lives in one giant bucket, so to speak. So you have to be very specific with namespacing thing, usually by naming them like events or searches or whatever. Question? No. Okay. So I'm saying, hey, take all the indexes that begin with events. And the second filter is age, take everything that's older than a day. And then below that I say, take everything that's younger than two days. So this, this filter says older than one day and younger than two days gives me just yesterday's index. So since this, since this action runs at one in the morning, it takes events, indexes that were created yesterday and includes them in the snapshot. Basically, I'm backing up yesterday's data shortly after midnight. So that's the snapshot part. Now, I can choose to either keep my indexes on Elasticsearch or I can choose to delete them at a certain point because this is time series data, right? Do we really care about storing all these detailed granular statistics 30 or 60 days later? Probably not. We want to probably implement some kind of summaries or roll-up functionality and then at a certain point we want to delete the raw data because it's simply taking up a lot of space. So here I created another action called delete indexes I specify the same pattern, events, dash, and here the filter is a little different that I say, delete everything in 30 days. So in this flow, I'm keeping the raw data on the Elastic server for 30 days. I'm backing it up every night or snapshotting it so I can recover that data in case my server crashes. I obviously won't be able to recover what hasn't been snapshotted yesterday. So if I have a crash at one in the, one in the afternoon, I will lose 13 hours of data and I'll probably have to reprocess them from the original log files. But at least I got yesterday's data and the day before and so on. So this way, I'm able to delete the raw indexes when the value of the data in them becomes just less important. And then, beyond that, I can also, after a certain point in time, delete the, those snapshots. So let's say after 90 days, in this case, I don't care about even the the data that's stored in S3. Again, it completely lost its value. So I keep data for 30 days on my Elasticsearch servers. I can use it in reports, queries, build dashboards using the data. Then for the next 60 days, for, the, for 90 days, it's stored on, a, on S3 bucket. So I can still restore it if I, that's what I need to do. But I'm paying a lot less cost because S3 storage and SSD storage is literally 10x difference. And I'm storing terabytes of data in these um, in my Elasticsearch servers. So it, these things add up. So this is like the third step in that flow that I snap. First, I snapshotted my Elasticsearch index so I can recover it if I need it. Then after a certain point, I deleted my Elasticsearch index from the server so it's no longer accessible in the queries. But I can still recover it from S3 if I need to. It's just a manual process for me. And last, I say, this, I don't care about this data at all. I will not have to look at it. And then I delete it from S3, because even S3 storage costs. So that's kind of my general flow, you know, from hot to warm to gone. <laughs> okay. And I need to monitor these snapshots, because these actions happen overnight. And I can get the data on them. For example, I can query the Elastic API and say, hey, give me stats for all the indexes. Or give me stats for, or give me stats for all the snapshots. Excuse me, or give me st snapshots stats for just this repository, or give me snapshot stats for this repository for this date. So there's a lot of granularity, and it comes back with a lot of JSON. But I can also have multiple repositories within the same Elasticsearch, and I can have multiple snapshots in the same repository, and I can have multiple indexes in the same snapshot. Well, there's all kinds of flexibilities you can, in fact, you can say almost too much flexibility. 
For simplicity's sake, I recommend that you guys start with just having one repository pointed at one S3 bucket that's dedicated only to that, and then put all those have those daily snapshots going one snapshot per index type. So you have, you have your events indexes that goes into events snapshot, and you have your whatever, clicks indexes that goes into your clicks snapshot. Just This gives you the flexibility to restore only one of the snapshots. Any questions? How tough is it to actually recover a snapshot? It's just another command I can show to you later, but yeah, it's basically uh, you do a put request and it's like a restore. So it's just like this is a get operation, get snapshot all. So you would say put snapshot something like restore. What you're doing is you're calling Elasticsearch API and Elasticsearch says, I know that I have the snapshot and it's in this, uh, this S3 repository in this, S, in this repository in this S3 bucket and restores it. And it obviously depends on the data and whether you've done like, like with S3 you can have what's called infrequent access or regular access. It's just, I think it's a little bit faster to restore it. If you're using Glacier, you would first need to restore things from Glacier to the regular S3. So that's, that, that I believe you have to do outside of Elastic. But instead of deleting actual indexes, instead of deleting snapshots here, has anybody used AWS Glacier? Like super cool, okay, sorry. So S3 bucket gives you, you know, like 99.999 11th time, 11, 11 ninth reliability. You can go for what's called reduce availability where it will basically store fewer copies of it. But you can also implement something called Glacier storage, which is really, really cheap compared to regular S3 costs. But if then to restore the data, you first have to say to Amazon, hey, move this particular object from Glacier storage type to regular S3 storage type. And that can take hours sometimes. I'm sure they have lots of hamsters running behind the scenes <laughs> fetching your files. But that's another option that you basically, you, you, that you would have to do outside of the elastic search. You would basically go into your S3 bucket and say, you implement an age policy that says after 90 days, move it to Glacier storage type. So then you probably wouldn't have this action to delete snapshots. Your, your, your flow will be hot data lives in elastic search, warm data lives in S3 and is easily restorable to Elasticsearch and cold means it's in Glacier. It's going to live there for years and it's just more work for you to restore it because you have to do this two-step process of first in S3 moving it to more accessible storage type and then in a Elasticsearch you would restore it from S3 to Elasticsearch server. Okay, That's another option. And by, but, but what you can do here is again you can monitor this via these API endpoints in Elasticsearch you're essentially monitoring your backup process, right? How many have had a situation where you thought the backup worked, but then it didn't? <laughs> or how many you did not have the situation? <laughs> okay, so that's monitoring. We all need backups, right? Okay, are there questions? So yes? So if you're doing a GET request to, for the monitoring, that data comes from the internal indexes that uh, Elasticsearch maintains. So that comes back really fast. But then if you're saying, oh, I need to restore that index, it'll make the API call to S3 API endpoint, and that then can take time to restore. It depends on how much data you got. I'm sorry, was there another hand? No, nope. okay. Okay, let's jump into Kibana demo. Okay. So this is the Kibana dashboard. This is the latest version, 6.2.3. If you're using 5x version, the colors were a little different, were a little pink. But you see all the different options you can do here. I'm not going to go into it because it's going to take forever, but I'm going to jump into the Discover tab. And here you see, do you want me to zoom in? This better? Actually, let me collapse this. Okay, so by default, what it does is it shows you the last 15 minutes here in this date time filter. So I'm going to jump back to the six month. And I generated some data for the purpose of demo, and unfortunately, it came out very uniform, being random data. In reality, you have a lot more peaks and valleys type flow. But these are the logs, air quotes, 
that were processed via this pipeline. So let's zoom in here. Okay. Uh, you can also specify the granularity. Let's say we want to see monthly. There, okay. Let's say we want to see weekly. That's interesting too. Okay, let's say we want auto. And in this case, oh, okay, so it's doing it daily. That's what it automatically decided is appropriate aggregation. If you were to look at a day worth of data, it would probably choose something like hourly or 30 minute you know, granularity. But we can see these documents here. Everybody can see it? Okay. So we can see the different fields. We can see the timestamp when it was created. We can see the unique IDs. Here's the index pattern, events dash date. Type, again, all the event, all the types have to be the same in, in, the, in Elasticsearch 6. And here's the AID and CAD parameters that were extracted. I also threw IP in here and I did a little bit of data enrichment, adding location of latitude, longitude map to that IP address. Uh, we can also look at this data in raw JSON format. And we can filter for stuff. So what if we only want to see data for CID is, let's say, uh, 11. Okay. Well, first of all, now it looks a little bit more interesting in variants of data, but we can see that there are 245 documents that meet this criteria out of 20,000 randomly generated documents that I set up. We can also say, you know, we, we want to look at specific columns. So we say AID, there's the account IDs, and then we want to say, let's look at the IPs and let's look at locations. So location is a special data type because it has latitude and longitude. So it has those two attributes, but besides that you have, you know, integer, string, boolean, etc. And we can, again, either drill in on these documents, we can say, oh, you know, we only want to look at something where, we can add another filter where, let's say, this one IP exists, because maybe some of our documents don't have certain fields. Again, you have a lot of flexibility in how you query for data, whether it's either equal to something or not equal to something. A particular field exists, so it does not exist. Just think of it as like, it, the, the query language is different than SQL, but there's a lot of very similar concepts. And we can, for example, disable these filters. So now we're back to having all 20,000 records. Okay, so that's the kind of like the raw querying capabilities you can do here. And we can build one of these, you know, sort of queries. Let's say we only want to do it for this. And we can share. I can either save this search. So this is CID 11. Events CID 11. So this, this will save it in Elasticsearch so then other people can access it. Or we can just share it like this. And we can create a short URL. Oops. Oh, there. And obviously not local host, but I can email this. And that's what I actually do frequently at work, that somebody will ask me for a particular search and I'll build the search and I'll just send them a short URL and they can analyze this data. It's a lot easier than trying to talk to somebody via Slack and says, no, you got to click this filter instead of that filter. So that's pretty nice. Then we can jump into this visualize tab where we can build different visualizations. So let's say we want to build a pie chart. How can you have a demo without a pie chart? We'll specify events indexes. Not very interesting here. So let's split it. And we're going to do, we're doing, we're doing aggregation. It's essentially equivalent to group by query in SQL. So we'll say aggregation on terms. And we're going to say like the field of, a, let's say CID, customer ID. And let's say we want a top 15. Unfortunately, this will be another very boring chart because the data is ridiculously uniform. In reality, it would actually show you like which customers are generating more traffic and that can be useful to your, to your internal users. We can also create a coordinate map. So I grabbed a whole bunch of zip codes uh, and lat longs from um, California for the purposes of this demo, but we can see that lots of searches were done from Los Angeles area. We can zoom out. Zoom in. Another interesting visualization is Tag Cloud. And we can 
say, oh, actually, we want it to be, instead of descending, we want it to be ascending, and we want it to be 25 instead of 15. Is that oh, sorry. Uh, Tag Cloud? Yeah. Uh, I know they have it in five, because oh. I'm at my day job. I'm writing five, two, and we use Tag Cloud. This would be great for the bartender. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can actually like set auto refresh, and it'll just keep refreshing. <laughs> yeah, people love auto refreshing pictures. Uh, so what you can do with visualization? See, even you guys. You're much more engaging now than you were earlier when I was showing you a Ruby code and config files. <laughs> okay, so another thing you can do in visualizations is, let's see, oh, data table. I think that's kind of useful. So here I'm basically defining a CID. I'm doing a descending, and this is basically top 50 in CIDs, and I can sort by these different fields. This is the customer IDs, and this is how many times they accessed my system, and how can you have data without ability to export it into Excel? Mm -hmm. So these are the visualizations. Now that I've built these visualizations, I can combine them into dashboards. So, boom, boom. Added them. Am I going too fast? No. Okay, so. And there is a dashboard of whatever the metrics that I care about. And I can, I saved it before, so. I'm going to go auto refresh, full screen, and put it on a big monitor in my office <laughs> and have everybody say, wow. Okay. Is, is the geolocation that you were doing there normally would that be done under post processing? Uh, the geolocation is done in real time because. I was able to map these IPs to these latitude and longitude. That's, that's what I'm referring to. Yeah. When you got the Latin long, was that in post-processing? This was when I was, well, this data is actually fake. These IPs don't correspond to these latitude and longitudes. The IPs were randomly generated. <laughs> but they have an interesting filter plugin where you can just basically take max mind public data set, mm -hmm. and you download it to your server, and you add another filter to take the IP address that's going to be present in that event object that we saw earlier mm -hmm. and enrich the data. You don't have to write any code, Chris. No Ruby, no Python, maybe, maybe PHP. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but you can do this, you can basically, you can do the IP to lat long mapping with existing plugins. So, but once the, once the lat long is here, you can build a very cool map. Okay, so we looked at the different dashboards. Again, you can save the dashboards. You can delete them. You, know, you can share them. Okay, so other cool things there are, let's see, oh, dev tools. This is dangerous. You can actually delete indexes here. Elasticsearch supports a role based authentication, so you can create different roles. You can have like a publicly facing dashboard that's doesn't require login because you're going to put it on a screen in your office and then you can restrict access to this. But here I can actually see all the indexes here and you can see quite a few but here are all the different events indexes but for different dates and then there's some other ones that I created. You can also use it to get like different stats like here if I had a cluster for multiple nodes it would actually give me useful stuff since I'm only running it locally. It says that my health is yellow because I don't have any replicas. So speaking of monitoring, there's another tab for that. So my license is about to expire. So it's warning me about that. You can get a free license, by the way, and just keep renewing it every year. And it will still give you lots of really good features. And then, of course, you can pay the money to get even better features. But here I have a, my cluster is yellow because there are no replicas. And oh, I guess I need to get TLS set up. Uh, but here's there's a separate health monitor for Elasticsearch versus Kibana, because again, they're actually separate processes, like they're running on separate tabs in my, uh, here's my Elasticsearch running, it's a Java process, here's Kibana running, it's a node application. So that's the monitoring. You can drill in on these, see lots of really cool things. 
And you can also use this management tab to view all the different, for example, users. And then uh, you can also set up index, which indexes you want to monitor. You can see all the reporting here and lots of bells and whistles. Quick uh, overview of hosting options. You can run it yourself on your own laptop or your har the hardware that you own or EC2 instances. You can use AWS Elasticsearch hosted option. It gives you a really nice ability to scale up and down, increase your disk size or decrease it if you need to. It does not provide hosted log stash, so you have to run it yourself, but it will give you hosted Elasticsearch and Kibana. It is a little bit behind Elastic releases, so they have like 5X, 6X, but when Elastic releases a new version, it might take AWS some time to get it, make it available for hosting. Or you can use Elastic Cloud. That is actual offering from Elastic Company. It's gonna run within AWS. I think they also support Google and maybe Azure. I'm not sure. But you would log into their console, you know, give them the credit card number and control your Elastic servers from their portal. But it runs within AWS, so you can set up all the credentials, you can get the the speed of responses. It's not gonna be querying for data across the internet. So you will be Are there any questions? Yes. Is there a feature in which um, Elastic might be um, allowing or where, where the Elastic could reasonably be the primary data store? Because I run into problems with data living in two places. Yeah, I completely understand what you're saying. Yeah, I had the problem where I had like my relational database and I had to keep my indexes in sync because I wanted to make user email address a searchable field. There's a lot of moving parts. Yes, uh, well, the, and actually the way I like to do it is I would do it via background job. So that's like another moving part I had to yeah. get. Uh, there are some use cases where I can think Elastic being the primary data store, it's still hard to beat SQL for certain things. Yeah. And it's like primary foreign key constraints, transactions, joins, triggers, stored procedures, they're just very useful things. Elastic does give you ability to do some aggregations I don't think there's a way to do a transaction in Elastic, so you're writing to your user's index and your article's index. I'm not sure how reliable that would be. I, I would not use it for something like credit card processing. But log file analysis, it works great. I have, you know, like I said, terabytes and terabytes of data, many gigabytes of data flow into it, and then I keep purging it. And again, I have a process similar to I described where I snapshot some stuff to S3 and then eventually get rid of it. Yes? Is there a way to get analysis on events? Like, Amen. Let, let's assume you have a million 11s, yeah. a, AID 11, a million 12s, and you see that they, they always alternate, but five times they don't. How would you find it? You would have to build some aggregations. You can do a lot with them. I'd have to understand more about the specific use case you're talking about. But yeah, you can, you can build all kinds of interesting aggregations. So. Did I answer your question? Sort of. I don't know what aggregation is. So. <laughs> it's, it's, think of it as a group by query. Have you done SQL group by stuff? So basically you want to know, like, you want to count how many AADs there are per CID. So you get a report that says CID 11 had 5,000 AADs, CID 10 had 2,000 AADs. So it gives you like a tabular report. You can do very similar stuff in that. But are you asking if there's like, you want to get an alert if, particular AD does not come across. Yeah, so mm. that's where you get into their paid stuff for like the anomaly detection. Yeah, okay, and only, oh, I, I've never used those features, so I don't know. Okay. Have you done something with that? It's actually kind of what I got here this, this week. I have, I have a lot of logs. And yes. Trying to find, this thing wasn't showing up. Okay. And I'm trying to figure out when and why. Okay, so the question is, you want to track if the data does not show up at a certain period of, after a certain period of time. So you expect a particular data point to come in at least once an hour, and it hasn't come in in five hours, so or two yeah. hours, whatever. That one you could probably do with Watcher. Yes, I was gonna suggest Watcher for that. Yeah, you, you basically, you would get the data into Elastic indexes, and then have some kind of a process that basically every hour runs a query and says, hey, let's look back one hour, has this data point shown up? And if not, alert me. I would look at Watcher. 
I think that's a paid feature. Or just run a cron, right? Just you do have to figure out how to anything I showed you in Elastic and a Kibana, you can do via Elastic API, and you can run those commands via curl against port ninety two hundred. That's what Elasticsearch runs on. So you can run a cron command against ninety port Elastic localhost ninety two hundred, and then specify the query, and then send an email if the results do not come back. It's a little bit of work to do that. If you sign up for Elastic Cloud, I think you get all the paid features out of the box as part of your price. I think there were other questions. Yes? Uh, so what's the conversion landscape look like? In particular, is there anywhere that we shouldn't go back so far because the paradigm or practices have changed? Like, I well, remember with AWS, their Elasticsearch solution was, I think, an older version. And didn't Elasticsearch come up with, like, version 5 just a year ago? Uh, they released five last year. They released six a few months, maybe at the end of at the end of last year. Uh, well, color. <laughs> the Kibana five was pinkish. The new one is darker blue. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Oh, so one of the big things I mentioned is the type, uh, lack of support of type. Yeah, I've mostly been working in six, and again, I, I have a system in five. So. All, I have no work with all of that. One thing to keep in mind is all, Logstash, Kibana, and Elastic were actually a separate product. And Elastic Company actually acquired people. They either acquired companies or hired people behind those projects. And they really did a nice job of standardizing it. Like, all, like even naming convention for all the libraries and plugins are just very consistent. And the, one of the things they standardized is the numbering. So it, I think at one point it was like Logstash 2, Elastic 4, and Kibana something else. But now it's like... You know that 5x works with 5x, 6x works with 6x. But they're obviously moving forward. They're trying to be backwards compatible. For example, if you take a snapshot of an index on 5x, you can restore it on 6x. So they'll, they'll do that one version, uh, so backward compatible support. But once 7 comes out, you won't be able to restore 5x indexes onto 7. So it can be a problem if you're using that kind of S3 archiving as your strategy. And two years later, you need to restore the old, old data, and you have since upgraded. So yeah. you know, what you have to do is you have to restore it onto like six, and then from there, I think you can replicate it somehow to the seven. Or store it some other way. Yeah. What's, what's your uh, infrastructure like? like uh, so I'm running uh, my own EC2 instances because that's how it was set up. I have three data nodes. Uh, I think there's C4 is extra large, or R, I forget. What, it, what the AWS and AWS, everybody familiar with C M R AWS instance, yeah. uh, and then I have a one master node that also runs Kibana and Logstash. I'm thinking about breaking out Logstash to be on a separate server when I need, when I need to scale. Yeah. Yes, there was a question. No, you. Asked uh, about uh, what's your uh, what's your data coming in that you use more often, and how does it come in? Logs. logs. A, a lot of it is logs. Yes. ELB logs, uh, some of it is JDBC queries. I'm working to, I have a lot of beats coming in. So I'm actually working to set up Redis in front of my log stash. So then beats can just, anybody use Redis? Okay, so it's a key value in memory data store, but it has an interesting feature called lists. So basically you can push to a list and I can push to a list and Chris can push to a list and then you would be able to pop from that list. So a metric beats would push to lists and then Logstash would pop from that list and Logstash would put it into Elastic. And this gives me, a, and there's like plugins for all this. So it's very easy to set up. There's really good out of the box support for this. It's just a few lines of config files. And this gives you, me a nice ability to protect Elastic from a surge of inbound traffic. Okay. That's, that's kind of like my roadmap. Right now I'm just uh, building a lot of logic and processing all these logs, writing a lot of Ruby code. I have actually several Ruby classes that I build. I have very, very granular logic specific to our business use case. But I'm relying on Logstash to execute it for me. So I didn't have to write some kind of infrastructure or daemons to run the code. I didn't have to write any code to connect to S3 bucket and download those files. I did it with three lines in a config file. And you're using mostly like Logstash and beats to feed it, not any... Let's see. Oh, yeah. So here are the links. I'm sorry. I'm using, yeah, so Logstash is a big input. Beats is another input. It goes through Logstash, actually. So Beats could send data directly to Elastic. 
it's supported. Have you had to roll your, any of your own inputs? Uh, not much. Well, we do have several applications that use Elastic for search, so it's basically just an API client written in, it happens to be in Ruby, but it could have been done in any programming language, so applications maintain their own indexes, and they make data from the primary database searchable via Elastic. So again, that's a kind of dual purpose. Lots of indexes. In fact, most of the data is all these index logs. And then some of it is used by application for searching. Anybody else? Yes. Is it worth the effort to build this out in-house or start with AWS when you're actually just starting the system out? Yeah, if I was starting, I would go with AWS or Elastic Cloud. They give you like, I think, a two week or a month trial if you want to sign up with Elastic Cloud, which is the Elastic's own offering. But I would start with a hosted thing. One of the challenges we have is we, well, the previous engineer provisioned very large disks, so that's just costing us a lot. It's you know terabytes and terabytes of space, and the only way for me to shrink those disks is to set up new instances, and then add those servers to clusters, and then you know. But then I have to worry about re increasing those disks if I had to. Versus with Elasticsearch hosted from AWS, I can just shrink and. Or increase the disks via the AWS console. So. I've used a, a hosted solution, which is like yeah. freaking amazing. Yeah. Super easy. Which one, Elastic or AWS? Uh, Logit.io. Oh, look, that's a different one. I don't know if they use Elastic behind the scenes, do they? Yeah, they must. It's Kibana. Mm. It's Okay. Oh, another cool company is called Swift Types. Elastic just bought them six months ago. They have ability to implement like site search where they'll crawl your site index everything and you just put a little JavaScript snippet, pay them, I think their lowest point is like $80 a month. So just check out Swift type. And uh, they'll just they basically think of it as Google site search, only you have more control over it. It's, it's really good, but really expensive. Mm. So like Which one? Oh, Logly? Yeah. Logly. Yes. So after like crewing it for a year and seeing that we like it, it's gotten to the point where Can you get the data out? Uh, wait, well, we're, like, file B is I think we're using is okay. on our own stuff. Okay. But so you just need to add another. Okay, so you're able to da send data from file B to Logly? Is yeah, that correct? To wherever we want. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I haven't tried that. So we're just sending to Logly.io. Okay. We can handle it ourselves. Yeah. But it's totally a great way to, like, get started and play with it. Yeah. I think there was another question. Yes? Uh, is there support for any other? Oh, Grafana, yeah. Okay, so I like Kibana because it just works. But yeah, I think there are other tools out there. Oh, one thing about Kibana is it only works with Elastic. You cannot point it at another data source. The one exception is they came up with this new language called Vega, which is like a data visualization scripting language. So you could use Kibana dashboard with this Vega, which you guys can kind of see here. I can build a Vega visualization. Oops, let me show you. But you can also get just JSON in, right? Oh yeah, you, you can get, the, yeah, so here you can build Vega visualization like this. But what this will do is this will hit a third party API. So if you have like Kafka, MySQL, Postgres, Redis, whatever, you can build an API in front of it, then Vega will hit the API endpoints, grab the JSON output and visualize it. I'm not sure if it's worth the effort or maybe it's just easy to move data into Elastic. But yes, I can. De I definitely see a use case for either alternative UIs for this, which you can build yourself. Again, Elastic has API, that really good support for libraries in all the major languages that I can think of. Or you can drag and drop things. The, the, what I like about this is that I can build my reports and dashboards, and when inevitably my business requirements change, I can either train my business users or make a few tweaks via the UI and say, here's your new report. I do not have to write new code. I do not have to test it. I don't have to deploy it. Okay, I think we're running out of time. I'm totally happy to stay and answer questions afterwards, but I want to give the next people a chance to get in here. Oh, I think the last one. Oh, last one. Oh, all right. Well, all right, we can stay more. I can answer questions. Thank you very much. All right. Hope you guys found it useful, that bit.ly URL.